thank you so much for uh, bringing me here. I'm going to talk about the preservation of digital art in very broad strokes, and a lot of it, I think, also applies to uh, emergent documentary forms. I'm not a conservator by training, but a curator, but I slipped into conserving and issues around conserving because 20 years ago, many people weren't yet thinking about it. One thing that is great and really good news is that we have made enormous progress when it comes to preservation, thanks to a lot of initiatives ranging from uh, the DOCAM Research Alliance to the Variable Media Network with its two initiatives, Archiving the Avant-Garde and Forging the Future, Inca Matters in Media Art, a consortium that includes uh, MoMA and SF MoMA and Tate, or the Unstable Media Initiative by V2. So all of them have uh, laid amazing groundwork. We arrived at basically four preservation strategies, uh, storage, which means keeping uh, the hardware that runs a work, migrating a work from one platform to the next, emulating, meaning simulating the software hardware or reinterpreting the work. And as every conservator will tell you, there is no silver bullet. Which method is really the best needs to be decided on a case-by-case -case basis. What do we do um, with the specific uh, work? We've also seen a lot of conferences address seeing these issues from Tech Focus 3 at the Guggenheim to Media in Transition at Tate. And there was also was a major initiative between uh, various institutions in the Rhine Valley in Germany, uh, which resulted in an exhibition at ZKM, the Center of Culture and Media in Karlsruhe. And what you could see at this exhibition in a back room was really detailed interviews and strategies for each of the works that you would encounter on the gallery floor. So you would have uh, Namjoon Pike's Internet Dream in the galleries, and then in the back room you could see how people approached recreating the video splitter behind the work. Or um, another iconic work, Jeffrey Shaw's Legible City, in which a bicycle is an interface. And again, you would have a setup in the back room that really explained how that work was restored. Artists have also become much more savvy in, from the start, thinking through methods for preservation. Rafael Lozano Hammer recently released on GitHub best practices for conservation and uh, revealed the methods he uses to sell work, to communicate with his um, collectors. And of course, we have also seen quite a few tools from the variable media questionnaire to Rhizome's web recorder or uh, emulation as service uh, provided by the University of Freiburg um, together with uh, Rhizome. I'm still using the variable media questionnaire a lot because it's not prescriptive, but a really great tool for thinking through elements of a work. And uh, it is, of course, available online. And what it allows you to do is really think through what is your source in the work? What custom software, generic uh, software, key concept is it using? What are your materials? What uh, is the display mechanism, the hardware, the sensors involved? How do um, performers, participants, audience interact in the gallery? What is the environment? So you can really set up a platform for thinking through that and and each of these um, elements has questions attached. So we have been using it at the Whitney to think through these issues. A uh, web recorder is particularly um, good for keeping a record of works that have been created on social media platforms such as Facebook or Instagram. And uh, thinking through that, and Amelia Ullman's Excellences and Perfections, of course, was one of the case studies for that. And I think emulation also is a great method, particularly for work that is situated in time. So what you see here is an emulation of George Legrady's An Anecdote Archive of the Cold War, uh, which is partly a documentary project in that he uses the floor plan of the Hungarian Workers' Mu Movement Museum as a background for really telling his own history. Obviously, if you would migrate that work 
it looks very dated today. It has aesthetics of uh, its time. So if you would um, want to see it today, I think reinterpretation and redoing it from scratch would be the right uh, method. But I think emulation also reminds you of a certain kind of situatedness and context in which a work had been created. So when we're talking about preserving software-based art, we still need to think through what form it takes. Is it a networked installation? Is it uh, virtual reality, locative media art, or net art? And we have to make decisions accordingly. One issue that has already come up is that software art has to be understood as a cultural and politically coded construct as much as the formal poetics and uh, aesthetics of the software code. So if you're preserving that type of work, you have to think through the programming language, the code as a form of artistic expression, and the aesthetic language of the code's actions. And all of that needs to be responded to. So when we're thinking about the work that early pioneers have uh, created, such as the algorithms, among them Manfred Mohr, Frida Nake, Vera Molnar, they were um, at the time still writing their code on paper, then that code was output on uh, punch cards or uh, punch tape, and then resulted in the type of drawing you see on the left. So the challenge here is, first of all, um, as a curator, saying, well, you know, this print is actually software art. What you look at as a drawing is software. And in the preservation, there is little need to fetishize that drawing on paper and try to preserve that. What needs to be preserved is the code that then can be output. Another example, one of the um, early artificial intelligence uh, projects, Harold Cohen's um, Aaron, which is a drawing uh, software. First, Aaron was drawing very representationally. You uh, see here an installation of it at the Museum uh, of Modern Art in San Francisco in 1979. And what happened here very quickly is that Aaron was actually associated with the drawing mechanism, with the turtle, which kind of superseded the work. So here the challenge was really negotiating the materialities. You, know, you have on the one hand the code, then you have the output, which is the drawing on paper, and you have a device that is doing the drawing. So each of these elements need to be preserved or you need to um, think through that. Screen-based and projected um, software art also comes with its own set of challenges. So you're looking uh, here at John F. Simon Jr.'s color panel of version 1.0. Uh, the left two are the original and uh, a test copy. On the right, you see the migrated version to um, G3. And not only did the work need to be slowed down because it ran much, much faster on the higher level platform, but in the original, um, John Simon actually just stripped the computer of its housing. And that's what you see on that background. On the right, with the G3, he is faking it a little bit because that's not what uh, the G3 looks like when you take it out. So he glued the components you see at the bottom to um, the platform. I was first horrified when I saw that <laughs> and <laughs> asked him, what are you doing? But then I realized that for him, it was as much a, a sculptural object as software. And it was actually very important to recreate that feeling. So here you're also negotiating materialities, but also the speed and the um, scale of the work. Another uh, challenge are works that rely on external software. So Zebrun uh, Verstig's untitled film, for example, overlays real-time obituary listings and birth announcements onto um, the opening and closing screen of a film. So what if the server with those um, providing those services goes down? You know, what if that vanishes? Do you create recordings to recreate the work? Ian Cheng, uh, Baby Feed Icaria, which is in the collection of the Whitney Museum, creates its visual out of a conversation between chatbots. Those are also external um, services. And uh, Ian recently came to us and wanted to update the bots because there's a lot of development in AI, of course. So we realized this work also has a digital life that will continuously 
evolved, so Ian created a GitHub repository in which we are constantly keeping track of all of the changes and are keeping copies of the work. So here the challenges are really contextualizing the external data and uh, preserving the external data and keeping a record of it. We already talked a little bit about documentation. Archiving exhibition context is incredibly important because works get shown in very different ways. Without getting into details of the work itself, what you're looking at here is an installation sketch of Martin Wattenberg and Marek Walczak's website, The Apartment, shown at the Whitney Museum. And the way we showed it was in a 2D kind of user station. It has a 2D component with a 3D projection. So now here you have the same work on the top left being shown at Ars Electronica where the 2D and 3D were projected next to each other. You had an input table for two people and an archive station where you could browse what other people had created. Completely different setup. And on the um, bottom right, uh, just at input table, and it was shown like that a lot in Europe. So we also need histories of exhibition context. Annette Decker, in her essay, Enabling the Future or How to Survive Forever, talks specifically about a work by Jody, Jet Set Willy Forever. And in that project, the documentation of the keystrokes of the artists playing with the work, similar to what we have just seen with uh, Zig, actually became part of the work. So documentation became part of the artwork itself. Yet another issue is raised by projects such as Mouchette, which was um, a website in which the artist impersonated a 13-year-old um, girl. And it's easy enough to preserve that website, but there was a lot of community spin-off. People created Mouchette um, fan websites, zines, etc. So how do you preserve the community that evolves around a project? That's another um, big question here. And I want to, in the remaining minutes, talk a little bit about archiving context specifically by using a case study, one of the early works from the Whitney Museum's um, collection, and that is Douglas Davis, The World's uh, Longest Collaborative Sentence. So when we're talking about archiving context, we have to ask if network art is contextual a lot, since it often makes context its content, do institutions start um, to archive the fluctuating context of a work? So that would require a completely new understanding of what an archive is and how it adapts to uh, changes over time. So the Wayback Machine, which we've already talked about a lot, is a nifty tool for doing that and also one that we incorporated in this effort. So the world's first collaborative um, sentence was given to the Whitney as a gift in 1995. It simply is an ongoing sentence to which everybody can add through a form. The only rule being that you shouldn't add um, a period. So um, in 1994, when it was first shown, you see here as a printout actually the first days of the sentence. So 10 years later, this work actually wasn't working anymore. So first of all, the submission form wasn't functional. Um, there was a lot of large text because tags weren't properly uh, closed. There was a lot of link rot, yeah, obviously. Many URLs were uh, broken and also garbled Korean um, characters. So we asked ourselves, how do we um, approach that challenge? And the link rod became um, particularly interesting because there was the philosophical um, question of, well, you know, do we just say this is what the web is, links break, or do we go to the Wayback Machine and restore all of that, which is also part of the natural environment? So in the end, we decided to actually create two versions of the work. One live version that restored uh, the piece's functionality and allowed users to contribute again and promoted everything to current standards. But the links and um, URLs originally posted were left broken. 
So if you go to page five of the sentence, for example, you will find a link to the White House. That's a very stable URL. Uh, forbid something terrible happens, you might assume that that will um, continue to exist. If you click on this today, then this is what you're getting, the home page of the White House. Then, side by side, we created the historic um, version, which leaves the code mainly untouched and shows the work as it would have been experienced way back when. Uh, but the links have all been modified to go back to the Wayback Machine. So if you do the same on page five of the sentence, you're entering the Wayback Machine and you're entering a time tunnel in that you can go back to how people would have experienced the work at the time. Only six months ago, refugees were welcomed on the homepage and you can go back to the Bush administration, to the Clinton administration. And that actually raises also in and of itself a very uh, important issue and question for preserving context. You can technically recreate how people in 95, 97, 2000 would have experienced the work in the context of the web. And I think these conceptual um, issues are actually the most interesting. One of the case studies here is, of course, High Rise Story. And even though this work might be more closed in uh, that it has built its own archive, there also is the question, of course, that high rises continue to evolve. You could um, expand that project. If you would do that, let's say 10 years from now, this interface and these aesthetics will look very dated, uh, as they quickly do on the web. So do you recreate a closed archive, or do you completely reinterpret um, the piece, bring it up to different types of standards, and add material to it? So all of these are questions that we as uh, curators and conservators have to deal with on a daily basis. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.